Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for Meet Music Knoxville. This is another exciting episode where I, your host, Nick Horner, uh, meets with folks uh, and is totally unprepared for the experience. Intentionally so, though. That's part of the fun. You know, I get here and we sort of BS our way through some conversation, uh, but ultimately have a great time because there is no shortage of incredible guests to bring on this show here in Knoxville. Uh, but before we get started today, uh, I first want to thank our sponsors for Real Knoxville Music, uh, Raven Records and Rarities and Hutch and Howard, Realty of Keller Williams. Thank you so much for sponsoring this show. You do so much good for the community and sponsoring the station. We couldn't do it without you, so thank you. And now, without further ado, Mike McGill. How's it going, Nick? <laughs> Good to be here with everybody. Uh, excited to be here. Where um, we've had some mutual friends in the past that uh, uh, said we should meet. We tried once, and uh, things didn't uh, work out. But uh, hey, here we are. Yeah. For all your listeners. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's great. And our sales. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing about this show. It's like, I, I mean, I, in my opinion, the listeners are just like. You know, that's just an added bonus, you know, that other people get to experience. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's, I think that there's like a sort of a magic that happens when you get musicians together where they're just rifling through all of those like weird connections that they inevitably have. Yeah. You know, uh, but without our listeners, so your listeners, yeah, I true. should not say our, uh, your, well, I mean, well, they're your I'm listeners the right now. Yeah. 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 yeah listen up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. We'd just be, uh, running around talking to ourselves you know like all of our uh, psychoanalysis that we've had all our lives so just uh, yeah well you know if he stays on his medication he's all right but uh. <laughs> oh yeah so uh you're out east you came in today on this beautiful as as you said before a nice balmy day the <laughs> yeah. f- listeners will be able to hear some of that the rainfall yeah i'm uh i was born and raised up in um, mascot tennessee and um, that's about 11 and a half, uh, 11, we'll say 12 miles. We'll round up. Uh, it's about 12 miles uh, east of Knoxville, downtown Knoxville. So, um, yeah, I grew up there. Mascot stood for Mining and Smelting Companies of Tennessee. We really? Were, uh, yeah, we're one of the largest producers uh, back in the day of um, um, limestone, uh, gypsum, iron ore, all that stuff. Uh, in the country so it was developed as a as a mining town and um so yeah that's where i'm from wow and um did uh your folks were they in the mining they were not um my mother was born in um in mascot uh and her dad was a um well in later well in his early life he was uh, a world war one veteran and then he um, came back from the war and was pretty, uh, you know, we, we didn't have all the, uh, the terms and the, the stuff um, for medical conditions from one that, that one suffers from, from, uh, you know, uh, war, uh, and particularly World War I with trench warfare and yeah. chemical weapons. And, uh, you know, and, and a lot of folks forget... Um, you know, that was, um, I mean, infantry was still on horseback. You know, they didn't jump on a plane and fly over there. They had to take a two-month cruise on a ship, you know, to, oh, man. Deploy, to, to deploy troops and stuff like that. But at any rate, he came back from uh, the war and um, was pretty, uh, obviously, very affected by it. And... Uh, and it was kind of interesting, you know, me being a musician and artist and stuff. Uh, he came back, and that's, of course, during the time of a lot of the uh, hobo movement, you know, the um, uh, Woody Guthrie, you know. And mm-hmm. and, um, and so he hopped a train and uh, stayed gone for several stints at a time for for a long time. But then later in life, he, he became a uh, – he worked on the um, – uh, on the Norris Dam and the Fontana Dam, and uh, was a painter, and um, 
uh, and then my grandmother, her mother, worked at um, Standard Knitting Mills here in Knoxville downtown, huh. which probably anyone's grandparents or great grandparents listening out there to us now, somebody in their family probably worked at Standard Knitting Mills. It was a um, a big operation here in Knoxville. And then my dad's um, side of the family was from uh, east as well, but more so over towards like Corrington, um, Corrington area. And, um, and they were sharecroppers. Wow. And, uh, you know, so there was, uh, lots of tales and stories and stuff. I never got to meet my grandfathers, plural. Uh, they were both passed by the time I came along and, uh, but both my grandmothers, I knew them. And, um, so I got to kind of live, uh, I got, I got to learn about them through stories and get togethers and family functions and things like that. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the brief, brief on me and my family. Yeah. So I, I mean, so in the little research that I did, um, obviously I heard some of your songs, Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's very clear. It's like, you know. It's you mentioned Woody Guthrie, but I I obviously hear um, as a big Roger Miller fan. Oh yeah, you know there's a lot of sort of that you know wordplay, but storytelling. Oh, well, sort of you. element in your writing. Um, a, I, I take that as a tremendous compliment. I'm a huge Roger Miller fan. Well, it, it's given as a compliment as well. Well, thank you know, you. Um, but but you know, where did sort of your musical influences come in in your life? Oh, man, you know, music was always, um, my brother probably was my first big musical influence. Um, he was, um, well, I say was, he still is. Um, he's 65, 66, I'm 51. And um, so when he was a teenager, he was obviously in, uh, you know, boys chorus, choir, singers, you know, ensembles, all that stuff, playing the band, marching band, concert band. Um, so it was, with him being so much older, it was a lot like being an only child, but it was almost like he was, it's almost sort of like, I mean, he's obviously my brother and one of my heroes, but he was almost like, because of the age difference, it was almost right. like an uncle, mm -hmm. you know? But um, he started out in uh, choral music, and and then by about the age of 15 or 16, he started, uh, he might have been a little later than that, but he, we'll say in his teens, he, he, was, um, he was directing and working for, um, for, uh, for church and doing the, all their choral music and uh leading their choir and all that kind of stuff. So I got the bug there in church oh, and, cool. and in choir. And what denomination? Um we were Baptist. Got it. Yeah. And uh don't judge me. <laughs> I got enough guilt in my life. <laughs> <laughs> were you guys like singing out of the hymnal or Oh yeah, the old yeah. red you know, the old red back, the mm -hmm. church hymnal and then the uh the the green i think it was actually called the baptist hymnal but uh yeah a lot of those type of songs and uh but then my brother went to uh singing in quartet music and he he was a part of a group he was one of the founding members of a group called the kingdom heirs and um you know from the time they were young adults all the way up till he was golly he might have been 30 he was probably mid to upper 30s when he left but um they did big big things i mean they had stuff on the charts and wow you know i was uh they had a silver eagle you know so when i was about 14 and i jumped started bucking gear for them on tours and Jumped on that Silver Eagle and sat in that jump seat looking through that big windshield. I was I was screwed, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to do. Uh, so that was a big influence, and I just kind of went along in the same in the same um, direction. Uh, took every music elective there was to take in high school. Um, had a, a crazy stint. Um, 
in eighth grade, I selected to go as a trumpet player to go into um, high school band, which was kind of crazy. Yeah. You know, here I am, this little uh, clean, um, you know, Bible school kid, and uh, I'm in the high school marching band and, and uh, concert band, and, you know, first day of... Uh, <laughs> first day of going to practice with the with the high schoolers you know in rolls all these guys in four-wheel drive trucks camaros mustangs <laughs> hank williams jr across a ruger and you know they showing up in metallica t-shirts and you know and it was just like holy cow i'm gonna i gotta try to be cool man because they're gonna kick this other kid's ass that i'm with you know <laughs> um which was another there was two of us and 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 Oddly enough, his name was Mike as well, but uh, we got selected, and uh, yeah, I, I did that, and then in choir, I, lo I always loved to sing, and so I uh, did boys chorus, choir, and had a wonderful, wonderful teacher, um, a doctor in music, uh, Dr. William Melton, and um, man, you know, from like, I think he had been at the high school since... It was either late fifties or early sixties, and he, on three walls of the choral room, th there were ones from every state competition that they had been in. I mean, wow. he was really, really uh, tremendous teacher, and um, more so just a, a much of a. I mean, he was just much of a better man as he was a, a, a choral instructor. So um, I did that and, uh, you know, took everything from boys chorus to choir to singers to ensembles to I played handbells, you know, theory. Yeah. I did it all. Huh. Um, and, uh, and, of course, played as well in the band. Well, do you, do you mind if I just elbow in for a second? Yeah, Because yeah, sure. I'm fascinated by this notion of, you know, church is sort of your foundational sort of musical identity, or at least the place where the spark got lit. Yeah. And I'm curious, um, how, do you find that that, or maybe in, in, maybe it's a question of in what ways do you find that that is, elements of that experience are still with you, sort of in the ways you make music now, or even anything from, from high school? Like, were there, like, things, it's like, oh, there's this one song that we sang, which I just loved the way the harmony worked in it, or there's... Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, the you know, harmonies what were just for everybody that's not musically gifted and or a member of a band or whatever. Just for average folks and or people that are in bands, you know, harmonies what we're all after. Mm -hmm. Whether it be life or whether it be in music or any walk, you know. So harmony is key. That's everything working together. Uh, doing different things, but everything coming together uh, like peanut butter and jelly. You right. Know? So that was a, a, a yeah a huge thing. We did we did an exercise in warm ups where he would divide. You know, we had about a sixty piece choir, so he would divide each section. So sopranos, altos. Um, tenors, basses, and baritones. He would divide all of us into, you know, first tenor, second tenor, you know, uh, first bass, second bass, um, and so on with the with the girls' parts. But he would take and hit a chord, and we'd all match our pitches on that chord, but then he'd move the sopranos a half step. Then he'd move, you know, the second tenors would maybe augment and then maybe the altos would go on a diminished chord, you know, and he would wind us through all of that making and then finally making all these different chords and variations, but then would come back into the resolve of being back to that major chord. And now we may have moved up three or four chords, you know, from right. we might have went to C up to E, you know, or something like that, but... So, yes, I, uh, I definitely get a lot of, um, I take a lot of that when I hear music, 
Um, and when I st- first started really kind of listening and breaking stuff down and and thinking about the quartet thing, you know, each guy had a separate part. So when I was a kid, I tried to learn each part. Mm-hmm. To and 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 of course doing all that by ear, you know, of just and trying to be a really really good mimic. Yeah, you know, that was my that was one of my things as a kid. I, you know, if there was a brown squirrel commercial on, I'd sing it just like the brown <laughs> squirrel. You know, or George Jones song came on, I'd try to sing it just like George Jones. You know, I'd try to be that person. Uh, I remember sitting in my car, you know, when I got my first car and listening to certain albums or um, not albums in the car, um, but cassettes. And, you know, before I would um, play it, I'd cue it up, you know, and give myself an introduction. And then, (laughs) you know, as if I was the guy fronting that band that I was singing, you know, so. But, yeah, I take a lot of that stuff. I mean, a lot of... um, a uh, lot of the influences, and I've held on to all of them, uh, yeah. whether good or bad. I guess in some ways, you know. Well, I don't know. Um, I don't know that bad is necessarily. Yeah. They're just ones that are important, and others yeah. that are just a part of you. Yeah, I, th- I do believe that as well. Uh, you know, I think one of the important things is uh, you do you. You know, that's what keeps you grounded is the stuff you've learned and the experiences you had, whether you were singing in Latin. Or whether you were singing in French, you know, we did a we did a piece for Allstate one year that were we sang it all in French, and had the uh, French teacher come in and actually help us with pronunciation and inflection on what words meant and how they were used in in sentences and you know and also translating the actual meaning of how the song was going, or 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 what it meant for the storytelling of of the choral piece and uh so yeah you did lots of experiences yeah. lots of experiences and it, you know and if i would have thought for a second um that i would have been in if i would have been so fortunate to do as much as i've done i don't know if i would ever believe that you know yeah um, I'll give you a good for instance. We I did a USO and DOD tour for um, the Armed Forces, and you know I'm in Guantanamo Bay behind the wires. Wow! And this was pretty much maybe a couple three years after 9/11. Yeah. You know, so uh, everything you know, it was a f- an actual functioning base there. But, you know, now I'm singing a Merle Haggard song, and I'm looking out at 300 GIs that I don't know if they're old enough to shave yet. <laughs> yeah. And, and the Bay of Cuba as my backdrop, you know. So how the hell did I get there from singing in French in a yeah. choral setting, you know. Um, so, yeah, I guess in a long roundabout way of answering you, the, there's several things that, that keep me that I believe keep me who I am, you know, and yeah, that were and foundational. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah. And I, I, I gotta say, there's one thing you mentioned there about the mimicking element. Um, I tell people that like sort of so much of my vocal development came from being really bored in chorus and doing that exact same thing, like mimicking the different yeah. parts. And, um, and, and it was that constant sort of, uh, using the voice, developing the voice yeah. that really gave me a tool set later on in life. And I have to ask though, you know, it's like as a, you know, as a songwriter, you know, there's a point or, or as an artist in general, there's, there's a point in which you start, you notice that it's, you're not mimicking anymore or it's, yeah. you're, you're reaching something that is a little bit more unique to you. And I'm curious, what were, do you remember that happening was there a moment where you're like oh this is something that's different or this is if this is a recipe of a bunch of different stuff i don't think it's been put together this way before yeah i you know i think i was fortunate enough i played in a uh so i'll get there i promise (laughs) Um, take your time so in the 
you know, we're talking about choral stuff. We're talking about band, orchestral stuff, you know, church, choirs, all that stuff. But, you know, my mother had a friend who used to bring me cassette tapes of, like, the platters, the Temptations, the, you know, the coasters, Jackie Wilson, all the Motown, doo you know, all that kind of stuff. Chuck Berry, Little Richard, you know, and that blew my mind. I never heard that stuff, you know, and I was probably, I was probably 12 or 13, but I didn't know who the hell Chuck Berry was. I didn't know, <laughs> you know, and I heard all that stuff, and then I thought about, you know, the music stuff I was doing and and that. So that kind of created, that kind of gave me outside influences other than just, you know, the, uh, it got me into the secular world, let's say right. it that way. Um, but then I moved like into bluegrass, you know, mm -hmm. I was in my 20s and I played banjo when I was, I started playing banjo when I was about 11 or 12 and then got into bluegrass and and then it wasn't the coolest thing, you know, to be a banjo player and the guys with the Molly Hatchet t-shirts pulling up that could <laughs> possibly stick your head in the toilet, you know. Uh, so I started messing around with a little bit of guitar, but I got into this bluegrass thing and I was always, um, I was always doing other people's material. And but now that was influenced from lots of different areas, lots of different genres. But um, I wrote a song with um, with some guys I was playing with at the time. Um, golly, I'm drawing a blank. I can't even think of the name of it now. But um, we wrote that song and we started performing it in our live show as bluegrass and and that was something that kind of oh wow you know I was I, I, I did that I created that um, but it was almost like I knew I was so good at all this other stuff that I was I was afraid yeah and embarrassed to to feature my thing you know and so on and on we go and um, one of my first gigs that I played solo, we did a we did a little benefit for a lady here in Knoxville named uh, Edie McCombs, and they asked me to be a part of it. And uh, I couldn't get any, I couldn't I couldn't find anybody to do it with me. And I thought, well, screw it, man, I'll just do it by myself big talk you know <laughs> and then and so i rehearsed i practiced i did my thing and and then get up there and it's i was scared to death you know uh even though i had played in front of countless people countless different situations and things but it was just me so we got through that and then um I think what happened when I first started really writing was uh, there was a there was a point in my life there that there was a lot of things going on, a lot of personal things going on from a relationship to being a, a single dad, making music for a living, uh raising her um you know uh being a big kid now, you know, and mm -hmm. and, and being an adult. So I just started kind of writing down feelings, you know, and just stuff would. I never got up with the intentions of saying, hey, I'm going to write a song today. You know, there was just things that happened that were important and I didn't have any other way to voice them unless I did it that way. Uh so I started writing some stuff and started performing some things um, in the safety of my own living room. And then as I got just a little bit older, I'd left the full band, I'd left the bluegrass things, and I had this little gig down at this little um, bar down in Fountain City called Jimmy's. Mm -hmm. 
And I remember I was in a pretty low spot in life in general. And the guy was like, well, I'll give you X amount. You come in, it's plug and play from this to this time. You know, from I think at that time it was maybe six to nine or seven to ten, something like that. But here I am in a cash only neighborhood bar with 47 TVs on the wall, you know, <laughs> and everybody drinking what you think they might be drinking at that time, you know, all the standard domestic, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But just a neighborhood bar. And it was fight or flight. Yeah. You know, and uh, and that was as much training as I'd had in all the places I'd been and the, the things that I had called successful in my life. Um, that's where it really started. Wow. And when was this? Like, year? Oh, man. Can you imagine? I mean, that would have been probably like 2009. Got it. As far as, you know, like yeah. like putting 45 minutes or an hour worth of stuff, and I'm going to play my stuff, and if yeah. you don't like it, well, you know, there's a door. Yeah. You know, and that's the attitude you had to have there, you yeah. know. Wagon wheel, you know. Piss <laughs> off, you know. I'm not doing it. I'll do it for 100 bucks, yeah. you know, or something like that, or, you know, um, you know, and then they want you, you know, you know how that goes. Oh yeah, uh, David Allen Coe. Well, he owes me money. I'm not singing him tonight. You know, <laughs> I, I just wouldn't give in. So um, I just really started. Uh, that's where I got brave enough to really kind of stretch out and uh, and focus on what I created. Mm -hmm. Now that being said, and still to this day when I do covers and things, I try to find stuff that's obscure enough that most of the time after a show, somebody will say, Hey, did you write that so-and-so song? And I'd be like, Oh no, that was a Mel street song from, you know, 1972. Or that was a, an old Stanley brothers tune that I just rearranged, you know, and put different instrumentation to or something like that. Um, so I don't know if I really answered your question or not, but uh, but yeah, I I had been writing some, but I was always afraid. And then, but when I when I started really my first full time solo gig, that's I just I just had it in my mind that's what I was going to do because I had sprinkled it in enough throughout the years that people liked mm -hmm. different things. And it was just like, well, you know, you can stand up here and sing, you know, something somebody was listening to on the radio as they pulled in, or you could sing something that you think's really good. Yeah. And something that makes a statement or something that, or even something that just gets out of here, pointing to my head for all the radio listeners, <laughs> and gets it out. Yeah, you know, that's the important part to me, I think. Even if you're going through slumps on writing or you don't know what to create, don't keep it up there. Because mm -hmm. then you're just going to have a overload. You know, the machine's going to be full. Then how are you going to be creative? Right. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah. So that's, you know, so basically what, 2009, that's 14 years ago. We're, get, we're headed to 14 years ago. Um, when that process kicked in, no, sorry, uh, weirdly connecting this. Do you record your songs? Um, <clears throat> now I will, you yeah. know, with technology being what it is, but now, yeah. you know, back then and even before, you know, you were always kind of at the mercy of needing an engineer needing right. a studio, needing a place. Yeah. Um, I always wrote them down. Mm -hmm. Um. So, uh, I mean, and I've written them on paper bags. I've written them on paper plates, you know, because at that time, before voice recording with your phone, and you know, you might have had the little the little cassette, you know, the tiny cassette with the mm -hmm. recorder thing, you know, uh, 
and then you could only listen back to it on there. I mean, you know, it was just like, yeah, I can't, I don't know what to do on this stuff. But, um, so I'd always written them down, and I've still got several composition books, you know, that's got either where it started, where one song started, or the idea, how it came to be, um, you know, the tremendously heavily edited versions, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the sloppy version, you know, all that stuff. Um, so I do now, I'll record things, you know, through the phone or uh, much like a setup we have now that's good enough to be able to put it out to where, you know, bandmates or or collaborators, you know, you can send it to them and, and have help with that kind of stuff. So, yeah. But back then, no, no, mm -hmm. it was, it would have been easier to, you know, in my mind, I didn't have enough desire to learn that side of the process as I did. I'm just this sponge with all this stuff that I've soaked up and I'm, I got to wring it out now, yeah. you know, and get rid of all this. Yeah. So, um, the biggest thing was to be live, you know? Yeah. And be present with it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that being said, I always considered myself because I had, because the, the way I had learned, the way I had learned, um, you know, to be a front man or, or an entertainer was much the same. I had never done that for a, a living in my life. And um, a buddy of mine, a banjo player buddy of mine, had came to me with an idea back in, well, that was, what did we say the Jimmy's thing was? 2009. 2009. So it would have been 8, 7, 6, 5. Probably around 2002, uh, 2003 maybe, somewhere around in there. Um I had met this guy at some festivals and stuff, and he was like, hey, I used to work for this company in Gatlinburg, and they see 100,000 families a year, and they're coming in to take this crime. Uh, crime. <laughs> I've said it so much as a <laughs> joke. <laughs> Not crime share, folks. Time share. I mean, <laughs> you, you you use whatever you want to there. You take it any way you want. Um but this timeshare company, and he was like, I've had this idea to come up with, while these people are waiting to take these tours to get their free gift for the day, mm -hmm. and or buy their vacation destination, um, there's nothing going on in this lobby of this big gigantic log cabin in the sky. So <laughs> we should we should come up with a show format. Sort of like in the old days, there was a group called the Smoky Mountain Travelers up in Gatlinburg. And they had a theater that they would put on shows each night. But you may be sitting up there at the Pancake House or the Peddler even, uh, or different old school establishments from back in the day of Gatlinburg. And in walks this five-piece bluegrass band. And just starts, hey, folks, tonight we're going to tell you where you come out to, you know, so-and-so <laughs> theater. And, then, you know, and they do a corny joke. And then, bam, they do two songs with some shtick in between. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, they've sold out the theater. They got crowds there that night. Right. And that's how they generated their, their deal. Mm -hmm. um, so we wrote a show and went up there to those people. At the timeshare place, uh, Westgate Resorts was the name of it, and we put on the the shtick, and uh, they hired us. Cool. Yeah, and uh, so you know we were making oh it was like stealing. <laughs> I mean we were fleecing Yankees and 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 vacationers and everybody that came through there. We were taking their money as fast as they could get, and they wanted to give it to us. You know. Yeah. Um. So. Uh, you know, learning that part of it really honed in my skills of being able to talk, being relatable, put on a show. Now, 
going back to the question you asked earlier, all the stuff about, you know, is there stuff that you brought from, you know, your influences and stuff you learned when you were a kid? Hell yeah. Because, you know, I watched my brother and that gospel quartet become the number one attraction in the entire park of Dollywood, bigger than the Log Flume, the Blazing Fury, whatever. I mean, they had that place packed, and they worked up there seasonal every year, and then they would hit the road during the winters or mm-hmm. off season. So, yeah, you stole every bit of that stuff fair <laughs> and square, man, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, so I always, back then, much like sitting in the car listening to the cassettes, you wanted to be an entertainer. Right. That's what you were, that's what, you didn't know, but that's what was really going on in, in my head. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was always kind of first and foremost with a lot of things as as going forward um, and then getting to the not being afraid and being able to play your own stuff and uh, so, so I put a lot more. I put a lot more into that. That's that's much as much as that is as important as having chops, in right. my opinion. Yeah, and being live and being in the moment and being able to connect and being able to freely give them what you want to give them and then having them like it. Mm-hmm. That's a big, that's a big yeah. thing, you know. Yeah, I can play you fourteen songs I wrote, but if I'm sitting up there and look like I've been sucking on persimmons, and you know, <laughs> and uh, and have no, you know, you look like, you know, I could be technically so proficient, um, but you're watching paint dry, right? You know, you gotta get it. Yeah, staring at the radio. <laughs> yeah. And being, and when you're thrown into that moment, such as I in 2009, that's, that was my defense mechanism. I had to keep it, I had to keep it moving, keep it popping, keeping things happening, you know, uh, shucking and jiving, stick and move, you know, all, you know, as many cliche things as you want to say. Oh yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah. So that was that was a big part of it, and still to this day, I don't want to. You know, if you want to hear, if you want to hear everything played perfectly, you want to hear everything done just so. You know, buy the damn records. Yeah. Buy the CDs. Download the music. That's where. That's what we do when we go in there because tape don't lie. Yeah. You know. Um, Have you done a lot of recording? Yeah, I did two, um, we did, um, we had stuff with uh, the Bluegrass Band, uh, White Oak Flats was the name of the group, which was the uh, original name of Gatlinburg Mm -hmm. of the settlement back then when it all started out. And then um, shifted from that and kind of went into this, alter ego direction kind of like are you familiar with uh the band hot rise yeah of course okay so you know mm-hmm. the uh their alter ego was uh and i'm just totally drew a blank Help yeah i can't here. remember either. i kept thinking red you're... knuckles and the trailblazers the joke i was gonna make was someone i recently had to play of course a garth brooks song at a wedding and yeah, then yeah, it made yeah. me think of chris gaines i was hoping you were gonna make oh. that reference <laughs> i will yeah. Uh, yeah. So, same thing, but less <laughs> creepy. <laughs> a lot less creepy. Uh, I, Chris Gaines might know where the bodies are at too. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, um, but yeah. So we kind of did this alter ego thing to where we electrified everything and started playing old classic country music, mm-hmm. uh, and called the Drunk Uncles. Yeah, because everybody's got one, right? And um, so we did a we did recordings with White Oak Flats, then later did a couple of recordings with the Drunk Uncles, 
And then um, I got involved with a good buddy of mine, Andy Perkle, mm -hmm. and we started the Barstool Romeos, and we did two albums there. And then I've sang on countless stuff uh, for uh, other people's productions, uh, other folks' albums, um, you know, as as harmony vocals, mm -hmm. which, I, I mean, you know... Yeah. Where I come from, that's, that's what potatoes. I really love, yeah. you know. And uh because I love I love seeing them first of all and then I love hearing it maybe a little differently than the person uh -huh. and saying, "Well, would you entertain listening to us try this?" And then, you know, you get your uh you get your creative stuff put in there. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, so sang on a bunch of stuff with uh, Jay Clark, uh, some of his recordings, uh, Cruz and Robin way back in the day. Um, uh, and I, you know, yeah, there's a the bunch list goes of on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Now, I didn't hear of any Mike McGill records. Oh. Yeah. That's who I am. Yeah. See how easy that happened? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a solo album uh, that's just me and a guitar, uh, which I don't know if that's what you listen to or not. Well, uh, what some I, of the recordings you heard. The funny thing is uh, you have a difficult name to find on places like Spotify. Mm. Uh, I, the, what I listened to was a, uh, um, it was a live concert that you did last well I, I i looked up some stuff i saw the rat you did a great cover of oh death I oh think yeah at, yeah at, wayne at, stock yeah wayne stock and uh uh it was a live performance that you did uh for what's his name ben fields, ben fields yeah. South of scruffy yeah, yeah. right because he does a podcast he does too. south yeah. of scruffy podcast yeah. yeah yeah young ben yeah yeah, uh, did that, and then there's there's all kinds of stuff you can find from shows from Barstool Romeos, and I think there's some stuff, some Drunk Uncle stuff out there um, with us, uh, you know, goofing off or some live things. But uh, yeah, I never, I didn't release my solo thing on. Um, I tried, and then got a little bit. Um, I had three, um, let's see, I had two songs that were not mine that I did on that solo record, but the arrangements are so different. Yeah. Completely night and day different. Um, that uniquely made them mine, I mm -hmm. felt, you know, uh, and that's my goal. On any song I do, yeah. If I'm delivering it, and I'm performing it. I want it to be mine. I mean, I want my stake to be. I don't know, man. Did he really? Did maybe he? I, I bet he wrote that. You yeah. Know, or, um, but um, but yeah. So I have one of those. Um, and and need to get that. Um, I need to get that put online. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. It would be helpful if, you know, folks are yeah. trying to interview you and want to listen yeah, to your stuff. Yeah. So. All right. Yeah. So that's one for Nick, there we zero go. for Mike, <laughs> for everybody keeping score at home. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, uh, let me, let, well, let me ask about another thing, because no, obviously our... I'm tired of talking, Nick. Oh, all right. Well, get the hell out of here. Then. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I won't kick you out in the rain, Mike. Good. The, uh, <laughs> so our initial reason for chatting was because of... Carol Cart, which I put on, which I was introduced. Obviously, your name had been flying around for a while, but I believe it was Oslo Cole who had mentioned you and your show that you do at the Bijou. Yes, dude, tell me about this thing. Okay, uh, it's the um, it's the Mike McGill Christmas Spectacular. Um, this will be this. We'll be celebrating the tenth year of that show this wow. year. Uh, it started back in 2012 as a selfish reason to get uh, everyone together with a good friend of mine uh, 
who was general manager at Barley's at that time named Rodney Lee. And uh, I went into Barley's one night, and it was uh, it was great um, <laughs> because you know when you walked in, they had your they had your drink sitting there because they knew what you were going to order when you walked up to the bar. So yeah, uh, post COVID, not so much. Cause now <laughs> I don't know anybody. Um, but uh, yeah, so we walked in there one night, and he was like, "Hey, have you seen this?" crazy shit they're talking about the 2000 i'm sorry yeah it's free. totally fine okay it's the internet go, go uh, wild. have you seen this crazy stuff going on with the um the mayan calendar the end of the world remember that <laughs> yeah <clears throat> well <laughs> the minds were wrong folks <laughs> unless we're just in a bad dream <laughs> um he said i think we should throw a, I said, uh, an end of the world party? And he's like, exactly. <laughs> I mean, if we're going out, then why not have everybody we want with music? Actually, that was in 2011. Got it. But um, he was like, yeah, if we're if we're going out, then hell, let's go out with a bang, you know, and have everybody we like and the people with the music we like and all the booze and drinks we want and and I said, yeah, I'm down. He goes, do you want to lead it? And I said, sure. Sounds great. I'll put it together. So we got a bunch of folks together for that, and, and it was a big success and had a really, really good time. And at the end of the night, I told him, I said, you know, I said, we should do this once a year if if the world doesn't end tomorrow, <laughs> uh, which is probably already tomorrow when, we, when that thought came about, oh, yeah. you know. But um, I just said, yeah, we should do this once a year. I said, maybe we should do a, um, I'd like to do a Christmas thing. I said, it's a good time to be humble. It's a good time to uh, have fun and, and, and be with the people you actually want to be around. Um, you know, because at that time, you know, and I, and I introduced that as selfishly because at that time I was working anywhere between 135, 160 dates a year. Yeah. So I didn't get to go see my buddies play. You yeah. Know, hey, man, we're down at the pilot light this weekend. Yeah, well, I'm in Jonesboro or wherever, you know. Yeah. Uh, or I'm at, you know, uh, some other place, you know, or we're playing here. And I said, man, I, I'll miss it. So... We started it there, and um, it's basically, we did it on a Sunday night. Uh, we did it on the Sunday before Christmas, the very first one in 2012, the Sunday before Christmas. And I got 10 guest artists, so that meant each, each guest artist got a song with a house band that I had put together, and then I would have 10 songs with said band and or with different ones of the guests to do duets or different things like that. And, you know, we had a couple hundred people show up for the first one. And it was a success. And uh, at the end of the night, he was like, let's do it again next year. Same time? I was like, yeah, same bat time, same bat channel. So here we are... 10 years later and it's the Sunday before Christmas. So this year it'd be December 18th. Mm -hmm. Um, we went through year seven at Barley's and in about, let's see, I, I jumped ahead just a touch. So we did it three years and then I decided I'd like to make it a charitable event. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Again, getting back to, this is a really good time of year to be humble and thankful for stuff and how can we do something to give back and uh so i had worked with uh aaron snuckles who was a promoter old rock and roll show promoter and uh he worked at the shed and with several radio stations throughout the years and i ran into him randomly one day and was telling him about the thing and i said you know i said you've been promoting shows forever I'd like to find an organization, you know, because I had heard all the horror stories just like everyone else had heard about whether or not your your charity 
was on the up and up. You mm-hmm. know, do these people actually, how efficient do they run this? You know, is the majority of our money going to right. the actual cause versus lip service, you mm-hmm. know? And Aaron at the time was working for Second Harvest. And he said, man, Christmas, he's like, I got the perfect charity. And uh, so we met down at Gus's on Middlebrook and had some fried chicken. And uh, we talked about it for the first time and um, turned it into a charitable event for Second Harvest Food for Kids program, Mm -hmm. which is, uh, if you don't know about the Food for Kids program, it's uh, one out of every six kids, even in Tennessee, Mm. are going to bed hungry. Uh, There's 18 different counties that, that are affected or that are touched by this program, and they run at 95% efficiency. So for every dollar, one dollar, you hear me? Uh, one dollar bill, they can provide three meals for a child. Wow. They have a 15,000 square foot warehouse up off of um, 321 going through Maryville. And that thing is jammed to the gills, you know, and it goes out. It helps feed children all year round, not just during the school year. Yeah. <clears throat> but it helps feed, you know, kids that are in poverty and, and you know, uh, all year round. So we, throughout the years, we have raised uh, around $25,000. So wow. you do the math, that's 70,000 meals. And... Um, and that was only started, I believe, in the fourth year. Mm-hmm. So year four, we'd always done them at Barley's. Year four was great. We raised a bunch of money for the for the uh, program. And then five, six, and seven, at year seven, we had 450 paying customers at Barley's yeah. at the door. So... We had just officially outgrew Barley's, you know, with 450 people in that downstairs. Yeah. And uh, um, so the next year we were going to move to the Bijou. And I believe if my math works out right, that's when our um, pandemic hit. Yeah. So uh, the pandemic year... We had the we had the date. We had everything uh, held and booked for the Bijou. We started, um, of course that that didn't that didn't happen. And I did a solo, just me and a guitar, uh, uh, a Mike McGill's Christmas Spectacular solo extravaganza. There you go. That's what we <laughs> did, and uh, we streamed that. And we were able to, uh, with a virtual fund drive and the folks that watched, we were able to still raise enough money to meet our goal. And then <coughs> the next year, which was nine, yeah, um, we did it at the Bijou last year. And, of course, it was in the height of the Delta wave of everything coming through. Mm-hmm. and um, But we still sold... Uh, 250 tickets Yeah. even then so I'm hoping uh, and really um, want it to uh, you know folks are a little less concerned than what we were you know and a little less freaked out Um, so I'm hoping this year is going to be even bigger and we'll Changed the format just a touch. We did last year. We did five guest artists and gave them two songs apiece, mm-hmm. which is um, all things considered. Since I'm the one that's driving the ship and painting the ship and <laughs> mechanicing the ship, and um, or as my dad used to like to say, uh, "Son, you only got one. We only got a. Um, how do you say it?" You've only got one. You've only got a one mule on the plow. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's this. You got a lot of work here ahead of you. So, um, but still, eight to ten p.m. the Sunday before Christmas, December eighteenth. This year, it's ten years. 
Uh, we've got some sponsors coming in this year to help uh, bring us a little bit more money. Um, we got the the folks at Harvey's Pizza and Deli mm-hmm. um, uh, down off of Broadway. If you haven't uh, had you a, a wedgie or a not, get your minds out of the gutter. It's ain't high school. A wedgie is their sandwich that they make. Uh, you should definitely they do great pizzas. Yeah, they yeah, do great pizzas really as well. Pizzas. So a go, good baklava. I don't, yeah. I, don't, I think I don't think that they make that to, though. Do they? They do make that. They do. Yeah. Well, they have a person who makes it oh, for them, it. but it is still hand homemade. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a. It's not a. Uh, you know, they're not buying it at Sam's and right, right, right. It and serving it. But um, <coughs> pardon me, Harvey's Pizza in Delhi, and then uh, our good friend Cindy Lou over at the Chop Shop. Uh, which is a uh, salon over off of uh, Central. Uh, we've been dear friends for several, several years. They've came on board. Right Printing is also on board with us this year, and we're going to have some merchandise, uh, which is going to be nice. This will be the first time, other than like show posters that we've made. Uh, we'll, we'll actually have some caps and hoodies and T-shirts and um the price admission had went from you know 10 years ago i think it was a five buck cover yeah and then it was a 10 buck cover you know a year or so it got up to 10 and then last year with the bijou we raised it to 15 um this year's admission price will be 20 and you get a free koozie out of the deal and a sticker um so um yeah yeah. I think I've covered it all. <laughs> wow. Man, that's great. Yeah. So we're we're super excited about that. Um just sent out all the guest invites. Um uh or actually let me rephrase that. Just got all the guest invite stuff back and the, all their song selections. So the way it happens, whether you've written an original tune and or you want to do a cover of something uh, the guests, you know, the, you, you get invited, you reply whether or not you can do it. Um, and then I want you to pick out something, maybe something totally, if you want to do something that's comfortable and safe, great. That's in your wheelhouse. But, <clears throat> but then maybe challenge yourself because you don't have to do anything. These bands, the, the band I have are killers. Yeah. You know, and they can play everything from Bean Crosby to the Kinks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, and we may even sample some Clarence Carter and some Rum DMC. Who knows? <laughs> but uh, we got you covered. And uh, so they make their selections. And usually we do it with like YouTube or, or uh, something of that nature. <laughs> and we get the style, the key, and the performance that they want to do. We learn it. We have one rehearsal, and it's showtime. Awesome. Yeah. So, uh, and it's been a a huge success all these years later. So, yeah, that's great. Hopefully, uh, don't let me down. Ten years, I'm counting on you, folks. <laughs> so that's the seventeenth this year. The eighteenth. Eighteenth. It's Sunday. It's the yeah. It's the Sunday before Christmas. So it would be December eighteenth from eight to ten p.m. That's right. At the Bijou yeah. Theater, uh, $20 admission gets you a free koozie sticker. <clears throat> and that $20 admission, do the math, I'll help you if you're challenged, um, will provide 60 meals. Man, that's amazing. For one child. For one child. You know, so, um, and it's fun. It's a fun show. It's meant to be fun. Uh, I feel like you'll be thoroughly entertained. Uh, we did the we did the one last year at the Bijou, and they booked it for the, this year the same night when we yeah. got finished. So, um, oh, come out, have some fun, and and it's really an easy way to give back. Yeah. So, amazing. Well, Mike, yeah. it was so great to chat with you. We're actually to the end of our hour, um, but before we go, where is the best place? Where are we sending people to? follow you do you have a website are you social media is there yeah just um facebook mike mcgill Mm -hmm. um and you can find me on instagram at um uh, mcgill billy Mm -hmm. 
<coughs> that's like hillbilly, but with a McGill in front of it. <laughs> um, you can find me there. Um, we'll be doing some appearances. Um, unfortunately, we've only got appearances left for the rest of the year. We'll be <coughs> we'll be doing the first time for the first time this year. We're doing uh, December third and December tenth at the um, in Rugby, Tennessee. We've got a little hundred. 10 seat theater up there and uh, both those shows are sold out already for the Christmas Spectacular and that'll be the first time we've ever took it on the road <laughs> <clears throat> and then the 18th at the Bijou and then I'll probably be off um, for like January and February and uh, we should be starting back in March you should be able to see us every second Saturday at the Jig and Reel with the full band. Oh, great. And then we'll, uh, last year, this year, I've been doing the second Saturdays at Jig and Reel. <clears throat> and um, uh, one one full band show at the Jig and Reel on second Saturdays, and then I've been doing um, one solo show a month. <laughs> um, in different places, we've been we've done them everywhere from Trailhead to you know wherever. Yeah. But um, yeah, just find me on Facebook and um, we'll get all that stuff started. We'll probably do some streaming shows from the garage uh, in January and February, just so nobody forgets about us. And uh, yeah, that's that's how you can find me. Amazing, awesome. Well, thank you so much for you're welcome. joining me on the this damp porch. <sighs> And one more time, I just want to say a special thank you to Raven Records and Rarities and Hutch and Howard of Hutch and Howard Realty of Keller Williams. Uh, thank you for supporting the station. We couldn't do it without you. And with that, thank you all, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks. You either is or you ain't. You do or you don't. You can or you can't. Or you will or you won't Either way, baby, a good man Well, he's hard to find You're either in or you're out It's up in the air There's no time to doubt And I really don't care Either way, baby, a good man Is hard to find Hey, it's an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And what I'm saying, darling, is a God's honest truth. You could kick and scream, you could cuss and fight. But tell me what good would that do? You know my mama, well, she taught me how to cook and clean. And I can please myself when the times get lean. Either way, baby, a good man is hard to find. Now sorry don't cut it when it's every other time And your two cents ain't ever been worth a dime Either way, baby, a good man is hard to find There's been too much talk and the talk is cheap And don't you make no promises that you can't keep Either way, baby, a good man is hard to find Hey, it's an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth And what I'm saying, darling, is a God's honest truth You could cuss and scream, you could kick and fight But tell me what good would that do I'll be gone in the morning for the sun comes up With me and my weenie dog and my pickup truck And 
either way, baby, a good man is hard to find. I said, now either way, baby, a good man is hard to find.